Councillor Norbury. Against. Councillor Patrick. Councillor Povell. Councillor Reilly. Councillor Reese Jones. Councillor Rennie. Councillor Rowlands. Councillor Tony Smith. Councillor Spriggs. Councillor Stapleton. Councillor Stewart. Councillor Sullivan. Councillor Sykes. Councillor Usher. Councillor Walsh. Councillor Ward. Councillor Watt. Councillor Whittingham. Councillor Irene Williams. Councillor Jerry Williams. Councillor Steve Williams. Councillor Williamson. Councillor Wood. lost, 19 votes in favour, 38 votes against and one abstention. So we're now going to move to the voting on the Liberal Democrat amendment. So um, are we going to do this by the traditional method, by a show of hands? Okay. All those in favour of the uh, Liberal Democrat amend amendment as moved by Councillor Gilchrist and seconded by Councillor Kelly, please show. Thank you. All those against? Thank you. And one abstention. substantive motion as moved by the Labour uh, leader Phil Davis and seconded by Councillor George Davis. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Meaden? Four. Councillor Mooney? Four. 
Councillor Muscrat. Councillor Norbury. Councillor Patrick. Councillor Povell. Councillor Reilly. Councillor Rhys Jones. Councillor Rennie. Councillor Rowlands. Against. Councillor Smith. Councillor Spriggs. Councillor Stapleton. Councillor Stewart. Councillor Sullivan. Councillor Sykes. Against. Councillor Usher. Councillor Walsh. Councillor Ward. Councillor Watt. Against. Councillor Whittingham. Four. Councillor Irene Williams. <coughs> Councillor Jerry Williams. Four. Councillor Steve Williams. Against. Councillor Williamson. Councillor Wood. taking over two years and counting 
for the highways department to sort out the repair and replacement of these broken street lights and columns and allocating the work on a piecemeal basis rather than awaiting for a complete backlog of all these repairs to, to happen and then finding it more difficult to carry out all the work in an allotted period of the time without taking forever to find the right contractors and the right um, divisional uh, departments to oversee these necessary repairs. Should this council be more committed to at the very least prior to prioritising as many of these repairs as possible using existing funding as you have so often promised during the many phone calls and emails to street scene that I have made over the last 18 months instead of neglecting those responsibilities, even taking the time to log these various uh, broken and faulty streetlights on the website has not met with any kind of results at all because there's been no further comeback from the various departments as to when the work was carried out, leaving you to think whether or not the work has been taken seriously, or there's no priority or time or schedule a lot of this work. There's a lot of examples of such routes where whole stretches are all this. This constitutes a serious safety hazard for people like myself who cycle a lot around the border and have noticed certain streets and highways where whole stretches of lights are not working at any long time. Given the weather that we've got now with all the serious ice and black ice problems and the freezing temperatures, surely you should, surely you should give consideration to prioritise certain areas where these works are that need to be done rather than leaving them on the programme for phase two, which will happen next year, noting that phase one does not include any of the lights that I have brought up repeatedly over the last two years about 25 streets and over 130 separate light columns, none of which have been working and none except two have been repaired. I also have to bring to their attention that two lights on the street nearest where I live, on Parkfield Drive and this car, were replaced, but they were not the two that I needed replacing, but two that were actually working. When I pressed this to Sean Brady, he said the contractor's cocked up, that's his words, not mine, and I must admit, why is that been allowed to happen where they take two lights that were working, replace the two that don't work, LED lights, and leave two lights that have no tops to stand as they would have been for the last three years without repair. That to me shows a sheer incompetence on part of the contractors. So the question begs, why are these contractors being allocated the work when time and time again they're not able to facilitate these repairs on schedule, as promised, a year late and still counting? Could the council please give me an explanation and answers as to why this state of affairs continues to prevail? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Stewart, let's move. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for the advance notice of most of the question. I hope you appreciate that, sir. I've already got it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so the first part of your question is. Uh, it is denied that officers have been caused of that contractors or computer issues cause faults. Our licence stock is all and is managed on a risk based approach where the active repairs are only allocated on a priority basis. Unfortunately, street lights go out regularly for a number of reasons and only a limited number of those can be prioritised for immediate reactive repair. Others are based on a lot of the same programmes for future replacements or required replacement components that they have long all the times, so that can be, that they cannot be attended immediately. Where's the echo? Is it? Is it the top of the? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so second part of the question. Um, we may, uh, we may, uh, we may, uh, we uh, may, we may, we may, the response is, this is exactly what happens. Prioritisation repairs based on location and risk-based analysis within the available budgets. It is denied that the council is neglecting its responsibilities. Um, the third part of the question. Um, the council, is investing significantly in its lighting stock over the next few years. 7,000 as of about 37,000 lights were replaced with new modern LEDs in 2015 and 2016. There were some problems with the road communication systems on some of these units, meaning the new lights are not coming on when they should, but these, these have now been addressed. A current capture scheme now in sight will involve replacing about 2,000 more units with LED lights April 2018. Details of locations are available to be online and will continue to be updated. This work to replace condemned equipment will upgrade the LED stock, which was issued for repair, but not for, could not be repaired without all the replacement equipment and was not an age of crisis location. A third of 12,000 to 15,000 lights are planned to be replaced with LED by April 2019 using a specific government loan scheme. There are many reasons why I'm 
then we'll go out and then we'll treat all this at the same time, including electrical supply faults awaiting attention from the supplier. But as indicated above, all the announcers are prioritised either for the actual repair or future plan maintenance uh, placements for safety. Once the whole LED upgrade program is complete by April 20, but all LED upgrade programs completed by April 2019, the light light council lights and stock will suffer few outages which can be cleared faster because the new LED equipment has a better light and is cheaper to power. In terms of Parkfield Drive, this is not correct for lighting that Parkfield Drive is perfectly working. It is all sodium light and stock and is, a, and is in poor condition. So any replacements made are not unnecessary. All the lights on the road are scheduled for replacement with LED by April 2018, except column 2, which is no longer required to provide necessary license coverage, so it will be removed. Currently, there is a power supply failure to column number 5, and a repair, repair has been ordered, and column number 4 requires a new structural pump, so a bit of item will be, be replaced then. In terms of uh, contractors, uh, you'd be pleased to know that you know, from 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 Boston next year, uh, the council will take direct control of how to contract and include structures for the rest of this. Was it explained that it might have been the attention? Sorry, sorry, Mr. This isn't this isn't a conversation between you and the council and missing them. They'll give you a response and you'll have the opportunity to ask a supplementary question in a moment. Okay. Right, so you may ask, if you want to ask a supplementary question, please do so. Oh, that's okay. Right. Yeah, so what it is, is uh, the ones that I've isolated that I need to replace as a matter of priority, the 1991 last year, which is by Great Lane Cemetery, the one next to it has been out of commission for about five years now, and a similar situation to one that I need to replace last year with a new column. So why are we able to do the same stretch with the two lights very close to each other, column 9 and column 14, but leaving them at nine only to the stay. We could have done the two, but save a lot of capacity mm -hmm. there, waiting to get the right attackers into the right job. That's what I'm saying, it should be done. As well as the matters, that's what I'm sure they're Okay, thank you. Councillor Whitting, do you want to respond to that now? Yes. I don't know what else I've said. Um, you know, all the repairs are prioritised, and I understand you, you've been put in contact with Mr. Brown, uh, with a list of you know, where, where the outages and these and response are every single one. Uh, can, Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Janet. Thank you for your question, Councillor Whittingham. Okay, colleagues, I'm now moving on to lead the set of members and chairs' report to the general Article 6. From pages 37 to 64 of your agenda, contains the reports of the executive and deputy scrutiny committee chairs. The council's invited to receive a no-lead report. Cabinet portfolio of portfolio of will not present their reports, which will be taken as read. All questions must be confined to the contents of the reports. Questioners, please ensure that your question is no longer than two minutes. And the total number of questions to any one uh, uh, report will not normally exceed five on, on any one report. Responses to questions will be reserved to the conclusion of all of the questions. Now, can I just um, remind you that this whole uh, issue should take, this whole uh, part of the agenda should take 30 minutes. That's what's allocated in the agenda for. So I ask you to um, be succinct in your, uh, in your questioning and in your responses also, please. Thank you. So now I'm going to move that up, up to members. Councillor Phil Gilchrist. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Two questions in for this section. One to the leader of the council, one to Councillor Chris Jones. Any questions? I just want to look at the one that you sent to Chris. It should have been made for our capacity. With your understanding, Madam Mayor, Councillor Davis will deal with that one. The, the question to the leader of the council was this on the Royal Growth Company. As the Growth Company now appears to be making good progress, can the Council's efforts be concentrated on that rather than the Gulf Resort project, which now seems to need a hefty loan from the Council? Why can't the developers of the resort pay their own way? That's the first question, Madam Mayor. The second one, which I now understand Councillor Davis will answer, I refer to the section on people with disabilities live independently in that report. Back in January 2016, 
the cabinet approved the aging well in Wirral strategy. The aim within that was an aim to increase the availability of accessible homes requiring adaptations by accessing 2,000 disabled facilities grants by per annum by 2020. <coughs> Question, what is being done to reach this target when the spend on AIDS adaptations and disabled facilities grants in the capital program is regularly being reprofiled? How many grants have been processed and implemented within the last 12 months? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, should, I should have said to colleagues, would, would you also please uh, draw attention to the paragraph that you're particularly asking the question on? That would be really helpful if you could do that easily, um, because uh, it, it will assist members in responding directly to you. So, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, top of page 56, this question for Stuart Whittingham, uh, Cabinet Member of Highways and Transport. Yeah, top of page 56 refers to planned improvements in facilities for cyclists and pedestrians between Wallasey and Broken Head. Now, the Cabinet Member recently approved new cycleway infrastructure at North Bank and Seacombe. This was despite the serious objections raised by the World Cycling Campaign. They correctly point out that the North Bank scheme creates multiple new junctions. Uh, by unnecessarily forcing cyclists to give way at sidewalks. This creates additional hazards for cyclists and motorists and would be a major deterrent for cyclists to use the new infrastructure. But those objections have not been addressed. The North Bank scheme is an early phase of the rural waters highway infrastructure and it is essential that best practices incorporated into these schemes at their onset. So my question is, will the Cabinet member give a commitment to look again at these serious concerns and meet with the World Cycling Campaign to discuss them in more detail. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Blakey. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have four questions to four different cabinet members. First question is to leave the Council. It's page 38. It is well believed the Council will how much will be spent on acquiring the Mecca Bingo and the location <coughs> site in their head. Second question is on page 43, a question to the Cabinet Member for the Transport Nation, Councillor Davis. It is, can the Cabinet Member tell us how many huge developers are in the running to be the partner in the World Group to Energy Company and what due diligence checks have been carried out? Third question is to Councillor Davis. That was for Angela, under here. Question now to Cabinet Member Lucas and Gaven, Councillor Patrick. Can the Cabinet Member advise that has been involved in the engagement and consultation plan <coughs> mentioned by the Cabinet Member for Finance and whether he intends for the proposed consultation to be scrutinised before going live? And the final question, Madam Mayor, is for the Member for Finance and Income Generation, Councillor Jeanette Williamson. And at the Council of October, the Cabinet Member asked all elected members, regardless of party, to support the budget process. She has cut and pasted the same statement in her report tonight. Can she update Council on when she plans to meet the members of the European Scrutiny Committee, regardless of party, to achieve this? Thank you. Councillor Matthew my question, and it's my here to Councillor Blakely um, since before, I can answer his and answer my question at the same time, that's okay. <laughs> which is, yes, I've had involvement, and everything that this council does is always open to scrutiny, as you all know, and I was going to ask whether Jeanette could elaborate for all of the council's benefits on the plans that have been developed around the consultations of finance. Councillor Brian Kenny. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My question relates to paragraph one on page 55, and it's, can the Cabinet Member for Highways explain how taking back control of our highway maintenance will benefit the people of Wirral and improve the quality of the overall service? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Burgess-Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just three questions. Uh, first, was the leader of the Thank you, Madam Mayor. First, the Leader of the Council. Um, 
In view of the fact that not all members of the council have published the register of interests, can the leader confirm that no member of this council has any personal or pecuniary interest in any of the potential partners in the Hoylet Golf Resort or the Whittle Growth Company? Um, second question to uh, Councillor Spriggs, the cabinet member for delivering differently. Can the cabinet member update council on her discussions with staff in Children's Services Department over proposals for the All Age Disability and Mental Health Service? And my final question, Madam Mayor, is to the cabinet member for Finance and Regeneration, Councillor Williamson. At a public meeting on Saturday, the leader of the council advised that the council will borrow money to then lend to the Golf Resort Joint Venture Company. Can she advise how council and how much and for how long and at what rate that money will be borrowed? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor uh, Jeremy Ellis. Thank you, Mark. This is a general one to the leader of council relating to the increase in inward investment and the various opportunities that what they're hoping for. And it relates in particular to the development of the golf resorts, the proposed golf resorts. So my question to the leader is that in view of the fact that last weekend, last Saturday, he attended a meeting in Hoylake with 250 people, all of whom, apart from two, voted against the development of the golf resorts. In view of that, and in view of the fact that they put together an alternative wetland resort on the same site as a possibility, um, could I ask the leader, will you now break your relationship with your uh, partner, who has already shown himself to be um, dubious, to say the least? Could you start an immediate consultation with the parties you're promoting, proposing? the wetlands resort and will you withdraw very importantly to me, will you withdraw next week's cabinet proposal to move to the next stage of the relationship with the so called joint uh, venture group? Now, colleagues, can I just say now, I mean, I'm not keeping a particular track of this, but I think Councillor Davis has had more than five questions now, and a number of them are the same. You've had four. Okay, so one more question to you. Okay, the more the better. Can you go around? Okay. Right. Uh, Councillor, sorry, less relevance. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have three questions to three separate cabinet members, and this will be the last question to the leader. Uh, so the first one, paragraph one, page 37. Uh, can the leader of the council tell us how the structure of the joint venture companies will grow and Japanese differs from the Harringay development vehicle, which has led to a number of Labour councillors being deselected in that borough? Uh, Cabinet yes. member Christine Spriggs, uh, paragraph one, page 53. Will the Cabinet member publish the report by PricewaterhouseCooper into the risk to the National Health Service of the integration of health and care services, as agreed by all members of the Adult Care and Health Committee. This last cabinet member is uh, Cabinet Member Jeanette Williams. Paragraph 1, page 57. Um, can the cabinet member tell us whether the 145,000 allocated for postal protection will be spent by the end of the current financial year? At the last council meeting, the cabinet member blamed cuts for the lack of the progress of fixing the borough's roads. Can he explain, can she explain, uh, why 221,000 from the government's Pothole Action Fund remains unspent? And can he, she confirm if this money will be used for its intended purposes by the end of the financial period? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Chenko. Page 55, paragraph 2. Um, I see that you've briefly mentioned winter maintenance, therefore I'm picking my question on that. Uh, can I ask when and why the decision was made to remove brick bits? This morning I've had no less than five phone calls and two emails demanding to know when they will be replaced. Ravy Mere is a particularly steep and hilly area 
and it doesn't make sense to have removed them from places where there is an obvious need. We as a council are very exercised about social isolation, and here we are exacerbating this very problem. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kathy Bottom. Um, I've got four questions to different cabinet members. The uh, first one, um, it's page 30, 38, paragraph 2, question to leaders of the council for the day. Are you happy to take Yes. Yes. The leader of the council believes that he can generate income from golf. Does he have any indication how much money the council is losing from not collecting fees at the existing municipal courses around the borough? Question two is for the cabinet member for transformation, Angela Davis, page 43, paragraph four. Can the cabinet member tell us how much so far has been spent on consultants undertaking the review of library and leisure services? including Shared Intelligence and BWB, and whether a third report is going to be commissioned. Third question is to the Cabinet Member for Finance and Income Jeanette, Generation, Jeanette Williamson, page 57, paragraph 5. At a public meeting on Saturday, the Leader of the Council advised that the Council makes money on lending our money to others and that everyone does it. Can she advise how much the total interest bill is on 38.5 million? Rural Council has borrowed from Barclays including a loan of 18.5 million over a 70-year term at an annual interest rate of 6.98%. And the final question to the Chair of the Adult Care and Social and Health Committee, Judith Manus, um, page 60, paragraph 3.3. At the last meeting of the committee, all members agreed that the report by PricewaterhouseCoopers into the risk to the NHS of local integration should be published. Can she advise when this will happen? Thank you. Uh, now, look, I think we ought to uh, go. Okay, how many questions have we got? One. Okay, I'm going to take. I'm going to take this, and this is it because we're going to have to have all the responses, and we're going to run well over 30 minutes. Okay, Adam, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be quick. It's for the cabinet member for finance and income generation, uh, Jeanette Williamson, and it's from bottom of page 57. And the Cabinet Member of Plate Council on their work with the unions for the legal needs-based notebooks budget for 2018-19, including the number of times she has met with union representatives during the current budget setting <coughs> Thank you. Right, okay, well, I'll take them in order. Yeah, okay. Phil, I'll take Phil first. If you want to go first, Phil, we've got quite a number of questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great to be popular. Um, okay, uh, in the order that we were asked, Councillor Gilchrist asked, why, why is this council effort been concentrated on the World Growth Company rather than all your golf resorts? Just to be very clear with the council why we're looking at these projects, um, and, and it's a bit of a throwback to the debate we had about um, the budget and the world needs plan. Um, we all know, don't we, that we have um, 132 million more cuts that the government are forcing on this council over the next four years, and we are facing a particular financial cliff face with the revenue support grants which historically has been the biggest block of funding that not just World Council, but all of the funds have relied on, going completely from 2021. So no more government support for local councils from 2021. The message is, you're on your own, okay? So that uh, scenario places us in a really difficult position because it basically means from 2021, the only income that we will have to fund the public services going forward are council tax receipts, business rates, and fees and charges. No other government support, which, you know, as an aside, <coughs> I find appalling uh, that, that a government has decided that it will cut local authorities <coughs> loose. Um, and that's fine for wealthy local councils like. Uh, Westminster and some of the the, the more um, uh, leafy suburbs of, of London who have lots of properties in higher tax bands. We know, don't we, that we've got two thirds of our properties in council tax uh, uh, A and B, which means we don't raise very much from an increase in council tax. So the dice are loaded against areas like Will with um, quite large uh, 
areas of deprivation uh, in the start. So there is an absolute necessity for us to look at how we're going to replace that lost government grant from 2021. And I make no apology for looking at schemes like the growth consumer and looking at projects like the Willow Crop Resort because that, those two projects will generate, if they go ahead, that will generate significant additional revenue <coughs> streams from the council that we will then reinvest in frontline public services. If we don't look at schemes like that, we'll get to 2021 and this council will literally look at its own money. There'll be nothing for us to fund public services or very little. And we know, don't we, and we'll talk about this later, that demand is, is, is massive for children's social care. Where are we going to get the money from if we don't look for schemes like this? So the reason why we are looking at both the golf resort, Phil, and um, the growth company is they have the potential, and it is potential at the moment, needs to be explored in more detail, to generate significant additional revenue um, for this authority, and we will fund that in vital <coughs> frontline public services. So, so that's the, the answer to um, Phil's question. Uh, Chris Blakely, um, will, how much will we spend on the council crime, the NECA, thing? Well, I think it was the Europa building, it's not just an um, the, the advice that we had when the report came to Cabinet that that was commercially um, confidential information and we couldn't disclose it. Um, uh, so I would refer you to the uh, head of the law, because um, that's the advice I've got when we discuss the report. Um, David Burgess Joyce, no, no, no mention, uh, so can, can, can I confirm that no member of this council has any um, personal or, or pecuniary interest in uh, the parties related to Holiday Golf Resorts or Royal Grove Company? Well, we've got, we've got a report coming to Cabinet on the 18th of December on the Holiday Golf Resorts. Item 1 will be declarations of interest. I suggest you attend and listen to the response. And the Royal Golf, the Royal the, the the Rural Growth Company, we've not yet had that proposal in front of us. We will get that in the new year, in January, and again, that will come to Cabinet. will be a, a, the usual standard opportunity for members of Cabinet to, to declare any interest. So, um, those are the, the, the answers to those questions. Je Jerry Ellis, um, yeah, it was a very entertaining meeting on, on Saturday. Jerry, thank you for your. Um, your very penetrating questions about the golf resort, which range from rural view to all sorts of things, nothing to do with golf, but you know, I, I admire your uh, 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 I admire your <laughs> um, Yeah, we, I mean, the, the, the issue about the Holly Golf Resort is, um, and of course, you know, not, not many people wanted to listen to this. We are still at the stage where we're exploring the, the potential for this uh, idea. Um, as I said on Saturday, um, uh, just to reiterate the point again, we're at the stage where we will commission a whole series of studies at no expense to this council that will look at all the issues that people ask questions about on Saturday. Environmental impact, economic impact, traffic impact assessment, flood risk assessment, and so on and so forth. That, those studies will be um, done by independent experts. They will be open to the public for everybody to read and ask questions on. And we'll do them throughout 2018. Um, and that will be the precursor to any planning application. Of course, ultimately, it has to go through the, the planning procedure. But I'm sorry, I'll kind of repeat this again. Um, you know, I, I think it would be absolute folly for us to, at this, at, at this point in time, completely um, block off any opportunity to attract substantial numbers of new jobs and investment into West Wirral and the rural, and over a million pounds a year, a year in income from council tax receipts and business rates that will, will go into helping us to fund those wonderful public services, children's services. I think, I think we, we have a duty to at least examine the, the potential for that project to, to work, but recognising that we've still got um, quite a lot of work to do, and that's where we are. Uh, and I, I just think um, it would be, I think it's important that we have um, consultation. I mean, I think it's a shame that I met some of the a number of people after the meeting who were in favour of golfers or but very fan felt the, the atmosphere very intimidating and were not prepared to, um, to to speak out. And I think that's sad. So we need to we need to find we need to find opportunities for those people to 
withdraw their view. So we get we get a balanced picture of, of what the, the local residents. I'd like to hear from local businesses as well in yes. Broadway yeah. what, what they think. So um, uh, and um, will will I withdraw the report from the council's cabinet on the 18th of December? No. no. <laughs> Um, I, I just just advise Councillor Councillor Ellis to be very careful about some of the comments he's making about the um, the developers, the the uh, Jack Nicholas Joint Venture Group. Um, I, I just think you know the language you use is, is very important. Um, I just you know, I think you use the word dubious. I, I just cancel caution um, um, going forward. <laughs> um, okay, <coughs> Councillor. Less rules. Um, how will the structure of the joint venture company and the Jack Nicholas, the joint venture company for the growth company and the Jack Nicholas group differ from the um, the model that Harringay is, is pursuing? It's totally different from the Harringay um, model, and you'll hear more about this when the report comes to cabinet in January. But effectively, the Harringay uh, model is housing based. And it's about replacing existing, as I understand it, having having done some research, it's about replacing existing social housing with new housing. We're not going to do any of that. We're, we're not going to we're not going to touch existing housing. It will be new housing, but it won't just be a housing project. It will be a project, and I think it will be quite exciting when you see the detail. It will be much wider than housing. It will include commercial, um, industrial, retail. Um, and leisure and culture projects. So it is totally fundamentally different from the Harringay um, project. Uh, but more detail uh, in, the, in the new year when the report comes to back to Canada. Finally, my mother, um, uh, Councillor Kathy Hodson, um, income loss on golf. Um, it is substantial, but I'll get the precise figure and I'll write you Kathy. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll ask Councillor George Davis now to respond to the questions. First, yeah. Well, first of all, for the first one for the question. Uh, I'd like to qualify the targets around disabled facility grants, whilst forms part of the ageing wealth strategy, is a supporting measure of the housing strategy. I can advise that this action is in fact to deal with 2,000 home adaptations per annum as part of the pledge reporting and is wider than just major adaptations. My officers were commend, commended for performance against the PI in 2016-17 in delivering some 3,000 home adaptations and as such a new target was increased from 2,000 to 2,500 for 2017-18. I can advise that performance is going well for this financial year with just under 1,900 adaptations achieved to date, and the anticipated year end targets to be achieved as there are no outstanding cases awaiting assessment. Adaptations delivered under the PI includes major and minor adaptations, including a hospital discharge, which is an appropriate measure of value of service and public and partners. Members should be aware that as this service is based on the need of individuals, which are all different, the level of adaptation is processed and delivered can fluctuate from year to year. Hence, reprofiling may occur across years. In addition, expenditure has had to be reprofiled previously due to the number of issues, including the fact that government has increased authorities' budgets for DFGs. In fact, officers I've just this month confirmed to government that they will accept a further 300,000 awarded on top of the 3.6 million already allocated for 17-18. I'm pleased to say that a review.